I'm Jackie Darrow. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of the Akron area, and I'm very pleased to welcome you tonight to our, our forum on money and politics, the impact of unchecked campaign financing, and what we can do about it. With them in fact. This program is being offered in collaboration with the University of Akron's Bliss Institute, right here on the University of Akron campus, Common Cause, Ohio, and the Greater Cleveland League of Women Voters. We thank our we thank our sponsors and we also thank our moderator and our and our panelists for their time to you know to offer um, us their insights on this very important topic. So who are we? We are the League of Women Voters, um, a nonpartisan grassroots political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. We do that through education, through programs like this, and through our advocacy. And our advocacy is based on our positions. Our positions come from our grassroots effort at the local level, consensus at the state level, and then consensus again at uh, the national. And we have a position on money and politics, and I wanted to share it with you tonight. We believe that campaign finance regulation should enhance political equality for all citizens, ensure transparency, protect representative democracy from distortion by big money, and combat corruption and undue influence by in government. The League believes that campaign spending must be restricted, but not banned. The League supports public financing, full disclosure, abolishing super PACs, and creating an effective elections enforcement agency. So let's see where our panelists um, will take us and uh, let us know on how far or near we are, you know, with regard to that. But before we do so, I'd like to remind you that there's an election coming up, um, and that's May 7th. There's a primary for Akron's uh, mayor and council candidates, and um, we encourage you to become informed about the candidates and to vote. Early voting began actually yesterday, so you can go on down to the Board of Elections and vote. So now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, Bruce Wingus. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we are really delighted that you accepted our invitation to moderate tonight's forum, Bruce. Bruce is a well-known and highly respected news beacon here in Akron, having served for 37 years at the Akron Beacon Journal and many of those years as its editor. So yes, we miss you in that role, Bruce. And we're happy that you're continuing the civic conversation through forums like this. So, Bruce? Thank you. Good evening. Well, um, one thing, uh, while we're having our discussion, you're welcome to be a part of it. Um, you have white cards. Um, have a question or anything that you'd like for me to ask the panelist, um, then please go ahead and fill out one of the white cards and someone will be around to pick them up and give them to me and we'll go from there. Uh, since we're here to talk about money and politics, uh, let me just talk about some money and politics. Um, from the Center for Responsive Politics, here's some numbers from uh, 2018. We spent $5.7 billion on the election. Uh, that's a 49% increase from the prior midterm election of 2014. Uh, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, there's been a $1 billion According to the Center for Responsive Politics, there's been $1 billion of that money uh, since 2006 has been dark money, money that we don't know where it came from. So let's go ahead and get our discussion started. <laughs> um, I want you to spit on the door or something. <laughs> um, I'd like for each of our panelists to start by introducing um, himself and herself um, and give your perspective, if you could give me a headline and maybe a lead paragraph on where we are right now in money and politics. Um, start. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Catherine Terser. I'm with a group called 
Helen Kazohayo. I'm their executive director. Um, and, and I often start with this, which is, I do this work because I believe in the power and promise of democracy. That the reason that I care about money in politics, the reason that I worry about the undue influence of major donors, of corporations, the reason that I'm concerned about that is because I want to be sure that our elected officials pay attention to, to us and that they're spending their time working in the public interest. And it's why, of course, I worked on anti-gerrymandering work, because, of course, I want to participate in meaningful elections. Um, and money in politics is much like that. Um, it unduly influences decisions that are made every day down at the State House, decisions that are made in Washington, D.C. And there are many times that it can feel overwhelming that because of the role of money in politics, it is very hard for individual citizens to feel like their hard work and their time advocating makes a difference. And so that's why I care about money and politics. And we could talk about, you know, ECOT, for example, um, which, you know, the, when you think about the electronic charter school, um, so, like, you know, Bill Logger um, and his, kind of his associates gave about $12.8 million. They got $1 billion of taxpayer money. And they took us for a ride. I mean, that's a really good return on investment. Um, and so it's very easy to feel cynical and to feel beaten down, but at the end of the day, our kids need a decent education or we're in real trouble. And so that pretty much describes why I care about the issue of money in politics. Um, and I would encourage you, if you're doing the tweeting thing, I uh, understand it's hashtag bliss, M-I-P, or money in politics, and also money in politics, um, because I think as we're having these conversations, we need to think about all the people that are not in the room. So the thing that's really hard about money in politics has to do with, we all know it's a problem. It's generally understood that, that it changes the nature of elections. It's also understood we don't quite know what to do about it. Um, so what, what we can do is have robust conversations about it. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my friend. So my name is Cindra Cole, and I am here uh, from a bit of a different place. Uh, I teach campaign finance here at the University of Akron and have taught it uh, for several years now. I'm a graduate of the Bliss Institute and very proud of it. I have my math. Um, I have done fundraising politically, so I know what it's like to be the person making those phone calls and trying to raise these you know, crazy amounts of money that we allow here in Ohio. So um, I always start my class um, in campaign finance, though, with two different quotes. The first one is attributed to Senator, Senator Mark Hanna, where he says there, there are two really important things in politics. The first is money, and I forget what the other one is. <laughs> and then the second one, and this is the very first thing that I teach my students, is the hydraulic theory. And it's basically that money, like water, will always find a crack. And it's something that we have to be diligent about. Um, you know, as, as we're looking at different campaign finance reforms and knowing that, you know, money is always going to find a way. If you look at past laws and Supreme Court decisions, folks who want to spend money have always found a way around them. So, you know, as we look at different things that we can do in the future, I, I think it's really critical that we keep that in mind. I'm Bill Rich. I'm a law professor I'm here at the University of Akron for Law School and the chairman of the Southern County Board of Elections. At the law school, I have taught constitutional law, election law, and somewhat res less relevantly to uh, this occasion, criminal law. Not totally irrelevant. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, the way that I sort of approach the subject of, of money and politics, campaign <coughs> finance, uh, and the First Amendment, which is, you know, a major part of my uh, teaching and expertise is that fundamentally it's about how uh, a small d democratic political system can coexist with a capitalist economic system. We're, we think of them as somehow going as going hand in hand, but in fact, in some ways, they're 
they're, they're in very great tension with each other, and the tension surfaces, especially in this area of uh, financing of, of campaigns. Uh, the core idea of democratic self-rule is equality, and it's no accident that the Declaration of Independence uh, said, you know, declare all men are created equal. No accident that only men were included either, but uh, we've been working on that. Um, uh, uh, that. That's the core idea. The idea is that in high, sovereignty adheres in the people, uh, not in a, in a monarch, uh, not in an aristocracy, but adheres in the people at large. Um, and on the other hand, the economic system operates on a, on a different principle, essentially the principle that that, that those who are most uh, efficient and effective in their deployment of uh, their resources, capital, labor, land, um, should accrue the greatest wealth, the greatest economic power. Uh, the tendency is for uh, you know, one principle in, that's supposed to operate in one area of the economy to kind of invade the territory of the of, of the of the other principle, or potentially the reverse, um, and uh, campaign finance law uh, fundamentally is about mediating between the two, so that that doesn't happen. At least it doesn't happen too much, um, and uh, sort of you know layered on top of that, uh, especially in the last several years, has been. Uh, the, the lack of transparency, you know, apart from the you know, sort of disproportionate amounts of money coming from relatively small numbers of people and influencing the political system, uh, there is the, the lack of transparency about that, uh, the, 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 the dark money problem uh, that I take it we're going to spend some time talking about this evening. But that's sort of my general uh, approach to it. Um, you talked a little bit about ECOT. Can, can each of you tell me how you feel money and politics is played out here in Ohio? <coughs> Do you want to go the other direction? Which, whichever, whichever has the most. Oh, well, okay. Okay. Um, so, has anyone ever heard about a guy named Tom Noe? Is that a name that some oh, of you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. So, yeah. Young, young people back there, have you ever heard about a guy named Tom Noe? All right, so so Tom Noe was a coin dealer. Um, he lived kind of Bowling Green area, Toledo area, um, and he realized that he was having some difficulty um, with his business, um, and he decided to get involved in Republican politics and became a major donor. And he gave to the political party, he gave to the governor, um, as he was a candidate, um, Governor Taft, um, and gave to Voinovich, uh, you know, he um, spread the money around. And in fact, in his divorce papers, um, one of the things that he said is that his business managed to continue simply because of these campaign contributions. Now, during the, the when George, George Voinovich was governor, he made this change at kind of the request of Tom Noe, which was to change the way that we could invest. And the way that it was changed it was allowed for what were called alternative investments. So what are alternative investments? Well, that might be real estate, it might be coins, or it might be beanie babies. So what did Tom Noe do? He managed to um, get a contract to invest the Bureau of Workers' Compensation money. Now, think about this. this. These are people who've been harmed, who are hurt. These resources are intended to take care of them when they get hurt so that they can get better. This money was invested by Tom Noe in coins. And when I said Beanie Babies, I wasn't actually joking. It, sound, I mean, it sounds ludicrous to think about it, but in fact, the reason they had to keep it all secret was if, if people knew that the state of Ohio was spending millions of dollars investing in coins, what would happen to the coins? That at some point there's not enough, you know, he gets another contract with more millions, um, and, and what happens, there's this whole thing about like, well, I can't just invest in coins. So he started investing in real estate and wine and beanie babies. And then he came up with this idea that what he would do is he would create up subsidiaries that would basically evaluate 
how, how much these coins were worth. Okay, you see where this is going, right? Okay, and you all, so many of you know this story, but he ripped us off. He ripped us off, he's in prison, um, and it's just a tale of state mismanagement and political connections. And some of that has to do with actual money in politics. Some of it has to do with when you become a major donor, you get appointed to boards. Tom Noe left college, left the Bureau, uh, he left, um, I'm losing it now, where, where did he go to school? Bowling Green. Um, he left Bowling Green as a sophomore. He was appointed to the Board of Regents. Okay, so often the tale of money in politics is the tale of influence and connections. And so we have all sorts of different ideas about what corruption is. And clearly what I described that Tom Noe did was cri criminal. criminal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was criminal and disgusting, but we also have to talk a little bit, because this is a wonderful opportunity to do that, about what I think about as legalized bribery. Yeah. Yeah, right? Because we have all the things in place to make Tom Noe possible. We have all the different rules in place to make it possible for major donors to influence how we spend our funding on education. And with that, I'm gonna send it to my friend. <coughs> so, with that, <laughs> I thought that I would spend a little bit of time in looking at Ohio and comparing it to where other states are from a statewide perspective. There are 11 states that don't have contribution limits on their, their state seat. So, um, I, I actually can't even remember what the 11 are, but of all of the states that do have contribution limits, Ohio's contribution limits on House and Senate seats is the highest in the country. So, looking at that, you know, the, there's obviously a lot of states where you can donate more, but the people who are setting limits, ours are the highest. And they're not just kind of higher, like the national average is like $2,000 for House and Senate seats, and ours is over $12,000. Yeah. It was just changed. Oh, it's right. 13 to 9.35. Right. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> so, yeah, for the governor's race, um, the highest in the country is a $50,000 limit, but we're still, again, like the national average on that is 3000 and we're at this 13000 obscure percentage number, which as a fundraiser, it's always fun to say. You know, this is exactly the number you should write. No, it used to be 10000 and that was easy, and now you have to get it down to the cent. Um, but anyways, uh, so I mean, so I think those numbers are pretty telling where we're at, and it kind of speaks to her problem with this this access piece, right, or this corruption piece. If you have the ability to write somebody a check for thirteen thousand dollars, I mean, if you lived in Montana, the limit's one hundred and seventy. Do you think somebody who donates one hundred and seventy dollars is going to have the same kind of access that somebody who donates over thirteen thousand is? Because my guess is the answer is no. I think everyone would pretty much say that that answer. Um, so that was the approach that I took when I was looking at this question, which is more. Um, and that's where we're at as a state. And let, let me just add that, you know, uh, that, that the thirteen thousand two hundred ninety-two dollars and thirty-five cents limit applies to state house races. Now there are ninety-nine state house districts mm -hmm. in the state, so each district contains, you know, roughly one ninety-ninth of the population of the of the state. Thirteen thousand two hundred ninety-two dollars and thirty-five cents is a lot of money in a, in a race that's geographically as, as, as small mm -hmm. as, as, as that is. Um, and so I think it is uh, noteworthy that Ohio's contribution limits are as high as they are. Now there, you know, there are two sort of interests at stake here. Uh, one is in preventing corruption and the appearance of corruption. And the higher the limit, the greater the op opportunity is for corruption, for, for the contributions to be corrupting. Uh, not many people will be corrupted by a $100 contribution, but we're talking $13,292.35. Uh, particularly in a relatively small race, a state house race, even a state senate race, potentially even a statewide race, um, you know, that could have a something of a corrupting effect, and uh, it certainly does um, create the appearance of uh, corruption. Um, on the other hand, to, to go back to what you said about the hydraulic theory, uh, if, you, if you make campaign contribution limits too low, 
um, a couple of things happen. One is they, they end up functioning, if you make them low enough, as, as spending limits. <coughs> Spend, spending limits, the Supreme Court has held uh, ever since Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976, are unconstitutional. Um, and so the court has struck down excessively low spending limits on the ground that they amount to uh, excessively low contribution limits on the ground that they amount to uh, spending limits. But even if the limit isn't, isn't that low, um, the lower the limit is, the more money is going to go into independent expenditures. Um, and uh, you know, unless independent expenditures can be limited, and the Supreme Court has ruled they essentially cannot be, um, you, have, you probably want to try to stake out some sort of reasonable middle ground. You don't want you know, to maximize, you probably don't want to maximize the uh, satisfaction of the interest in preventing corruption and the appearance of corruption at the, you know, too much at the expense of having the money go into independent expenditures um, and especially dark money independent ex expenditures. So the question is should Ohio's limits be lowered? And I think a good argument can be made that they should be. Um, and, you know, as, as you say, compared to the rest of the country, they're pretty high. Um, but you probably don't want to go overboard. The federal limits are, are, are $2,800 now uh, per, uh, we should say the 13,292 is per election period. There's a primary and there's a general. So double that, right? You're, you're at over uh, $26,000 now in, in, a, in an election year is what can be raised. At the federal level, it's, it's, it's 2,800. Uh, per election period, so double that for the, the entire year. Um, and I, I kind of think that 2800 might be a little on the low side at this point, um, mainly because the, it would be, uh, probably, it's probably pushing too much money into independent expenditures, and especially the dark money <coughs> uh, independent expenditures. And, uh, but, so I think at the federal level, we might consider the possibility of raising it some, not a lot, but some. At the state level, we might consider lowering it uh, so that we achieve some sort of middle ground. I just want to add one thing with that. Um, I think one thing that we need to consider here, too, is the cost of politics in Ohio. We have three pretty expensive media markets. And so for statewide races where you're trying to communicate to all three of those, I mean, sometimes even with these high limits, it's hard for statewide candidates to be able to raise the amount of money that you need to to be able to communicate your message over those media markets. But that same argument doesn't necessarily apply to a House race or a Senate race where they don't need to be getting out their message in all of those media markets. So. Oh, I wanted to add something too, if I may. So um, during the special session, when they passed the limit of ten thousand dollars, that was then kind of set to like into the inflation index. Um, one of the things, that, the reasons that they said they put it so high was exactly what you described, which was the hydraulic theory. But the thing, the thing that's really important to know is during our lap, you know, during two thousand eighteen, there was certainly dark money spending and independent spending, especially during the primary. Um, and so having super high limits doesn't match necessarily mean that the money will only go to candidates. So I, sometimes I think, yes, it's true, you know, I, I usually, as opposed to hydraulics, I think about it like a waterbed, you know, it, like you smush this way, it'll smush that way up. Um, I, I, but I also think sometimes the argument for really high limits doesn't actually get at what they think it'll get at because, of course, we did have independent expenditures. Well, I think it turns into a case of, at least here in Ohio, I think we saw, well, not just here in Ohio, across the country, where the campaigns are being positive and spreading all of you know, their messaging points, and then it gives the opportunity for that dark money to really go negative and go for the jugular. And, that, I, and you know, I think you can probably think back to some commercials, specifically here where that happened, and maybe you all have been talking about spending limits with, in relation to candidates. We've talked about a lot of money in politics. Where's the other money going that doesn't go to the candidates? Can you talk just briefly about that for a minute? Yeah, and we, we're just to be clear, we're talking about contributions, not spending. Yeah, yeah, no, the contribution. Uh, well, it, <laughs> it, it goes, 
uh, various and sometimes uh, sometimes pretty interesting places. Uh, the uh, sort of uh, oldest destination, I guess you would say, would be the traditional political action committees, uh, which are now all, almost seem kind of quaint in some <laughs> uh, in, in some respects. Um, and th and there's, they're at the federal level, even and at the state level as well, they're subject to uh, pretty significant regulations requiring disclosure of both contributions and expenditures, uh, and uh, you know, subject to contribution limits. Um, PACs uh, can, if they keep the money separate, also do independent expenditures. Um, and, uh, but as I said, that's kind of old-fashioned. That's sort of, you know, then what came next was the, the so-called 527s uh, and uh, the super PACs. Uh, and then more recently, the 501c4s have become an important um, source of independent expenditures. Um, and 501c3s even have gotten into, into the act. Th these numbers, 501c3, 501c4, are referred to uh, sections and subsections of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, 501c4s are usually referred to as social welfare organizations. They're non-profits, uh, <coughs> but they're not charitable and uh, contri uh, uh, contributions to them are not tax deductible. 501c3s are charitable, education, scientific, etc., and contributions to the 501c3s are uh, Tax deductible, uh, and they're the ones that are subject to the greatest limitations of what they can do. Some of the limitations have not been uh, as fully enforced as they might be by entering the revenue service. Is that money, that dark money you're know, talking about, is that regulated at all? Is there any regulation around that? Well, but but by dark money, by definition, we mean uh, money that gets expended. Uh, under circumstances where you can't tell where it comes from, that because it's not it's not reported, right? And uh, and so the five hundred one c fours don't have to report where they're getting their money from. Uh, and oh, I forgot to mention uh, limited liability corporations, which are increasingly being used to funnel money into independent expenditure organizations, so that uh, you can't see where the money really came from, because you can't find out. Uh, you, you can't simply pierce the LLC. And along those lines, uh, we talk about regulations and restrictions. So for Super PAC and C4 organizations, um, again, from a reporting standpoint, there's not really regulations. They don't, you know, have to disclose your donors, etc. But one thing that that is um, a regulation is there is no communication allowed with. Um, so like, so like, let's say you set up a Super PAC that's supporting a candidate. There cannot be any coordination between that super PAC and the candidate's campaign committee. What is being enforced in theory? In theory. <laughs> <laughs> what is being enforced and what has happened? You know, so, so just to, to make the sort of small technical point here, um, if there is coordination, then that's a contribution. <coughs> it's a contribution <coughs> limits, okay? um, but there's very little enforcement. Of, of the no coordination rule, uh, to some extent that's understandable because it, it, you know, it's sort of inherently hard to detect. Uh, but even when it's flagrant, there doesn't seem to be much enforcement. People are uh, and you can even, you know, the candidate can even help raise money at an event for the independent expenditure organization. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so there, uh, obviously, like many of you, my mind went all sorts of different directions. Uh, sometimes when we're talking about independent expenditures, we're off, often talking about kind of these political advertisements. Um, we're talking about what you see on the television, or perhaps you see online, uh, and I think there are lots of different creative ways to spend money to influence the election and not get caught until you know you're you basically leave voters in the dark as they go to the polls, and and we should have that information. You know, we should be able to understand who is influencing the election. If we see a political ad, we should be able to say 
to consider the source of this communication. You know, is, are these, is this the Nurses Association that's talking to us? Is it BP Petroleum? Is it First Energy? Um, is, it, is it the PTA? We should have the right to consider that information because it makes us better informed voters. The other thing is that the, the work it takes to try to figure out who actually you know, spent in our elections, we figure that stuff out way after the election. And how do you do it? You look at like corporate reports, you look at what the 990s, so, uh, you know, folks like, um, there's, a, there's a campaign finance group called Issue One, they got together with ProRepublica to try to do a good database looking at where the money originated. And I think, I think that's really helpful for us to understand that basically a billion dollars has been spent in dark money since 2010 when Citizens United versus FEC said it was okay to do this. Now, at the same time that the, the, the court said, hey, it's so sad. I, I love this. Um, Justice Kennedy said, it's, it's just it's for too long. It's for too long. Um, corporations' voices have been stifled. I'm sorry, we all around in 2010. I bet you all knew what they wanted, right? Um, but for too long, their voices have been stifled that they have a First Amendment right to speech. Okay. I don't know about you, but um, I'm a human, you're a human, he's a human. Um, human beings have a right to free speech. I'm not so sure about corporations that are artificial entities. And how incredibly naive, so incredibly naive to think that these do not actually have some influence on the decisions that are made when it came to governing. How incredibly naive. And on top of that, we have had now nine years to pass good anti-coordination rules. We, we, we know that they're a joke, they are a joke. Unless I say to you, oh by the way, I'm gonna run an ad, here's my polling. I mean, you have to have really detailed things to engage in what they call coordination. And then even then, because the FEC is so darn toothless, a Federal Elections Commission is so darn toothless, you still might get away with it. Um, and so when I think about well, the things that we have not done in the past nine years, we have not improved disclosure when it comes to the dark money. We've just let basically a bunch of alphabet soup, like he described, basically take over our elections. And then we haven't reinforced the coordination. And I understand that there may not be political will simply because they have money. <laughs> but that is not acceptable. That in fact, I live in the United States of America, I am proud to be a voter, and I want to actually be sure that my elections are meaningful and that I have good information when I go there. Um, somebody else in the audience has a spinning head too. <laughs> any, of, um, any of you have any other uh, thoughts to add to what she just said about why dark money, why we allow that to exist? Senator, about why we do. Yeah, why. Why do we allow this to exist? It sounds like the political will is not there, what you're saying. To sure, it feels like that. Well, the, the political will as expressed through the system that's already influenced by dark money. Uh, it's, 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 it's sort of uh, self-fulfilling, really. Um, it, you know, I, I think it's not completely unthinkable that you know, we'll eventually make progress on this, uh, on this issue. I did want to mention, by the way, that that you know, one uh, one way in which uh, there's uh, something like coordination going on, if it isn't entirely literally coordination, is you know a uh, candidate slash office holders uh, former campaign manager heads up an independent expenditure entity that does independent expenditures in the race that that their former uh, boss uh, is. Is one, of the, one of the things that could be considered would be, you know, some sort of uh, some sort of uh, period of time when the person is disqualified from uh, doing independent expenditures uh, in a race that involves their their, their former boss. I, I mean, just to piggyback kind of on what they both said, if, if we're going to make any change in this area, then it needs to be bipartisan. It's nothing's going to be successful unless there are folks from both sides. If you look at some of the campaign finance laws in the past, they, they were bipartisan, and it took a lot of work on both sides to make it happen. Right now, that's just not working. So.
So if I, I mean, it, it just goes back to demanding more of our elected officials um, for so many things, and campaign finance is unfortunately just falling further and further down. But then just could we get back to the why question? I think it pretty much comes down to uh, a number of people who are in the position to uh, change things got there in part because of dark money and stay, are able to stay there in part because of dark money, but it's not necessarily their interest <coughs> to limit it. Uh, someone in the audience would like a real quick one sentence definition of a super PAC to help. Well, we all love an expert. <laughs> well, uh, uh, a super PAC is an entity that, that uh, does independent expenditures and does not contribute to campaigns. Um, and as a result, is, uh, there are no limits on the expenditures that they make in any given race or total expenditures. Um, and that it doesn't have to uh, report the, the, their con the contributions they receive, the sources of their money. Okay. Um, here's one from the audience. That, by the way, <laughs> one that's not a C 501c3 or 501c4. Partly a negative designation. We just don't call those super PACs. And I also wanted to highlight um, all of you people who like to look at YouTube. Um, you should look up Stephen Colbert <laughs> and Trevor Potter oh, talking yeah. about super PACs. Totally worth your while. Yeah, no, that, that's actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone else in the audience wants to know how do you feel about uh, the, the uh, candidates in the Democratic <laughs> Party collecting money only from uh, small donors? Uh, will they be not spent? Who's not spent? So, so one of the reasons why um, we keep the system that we have is because the folks that want to get elected are caught in the system that we have. And they could work together to improve it. They could work together to change it. Um, uh, how many of you worked on the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act, um, also known as McCain-Feingold? <coughs> I spent 10 years on it. Um, and so as, as, we think about, as we think about that effort and how much time it takes, um, I go back and I think about um, the last time that we had a really good, robust disclosure bill. And um, it was sponsored by a guy named John Husted. He is now a lieutenant governor. Um, he was in the Ohio Senate at that point. It was really good. It was strong. It was good. It was robust disclosure. But he made a mistake. He decided to run for Secretary of State. And the other chamber was led by Democrats. And they didn't want him to give a win because he was running for Secretary of State. And we have not had a decent disclosure bill since. So. There are lots of different reasons for that. Um, there, oh, I, I tended to hear him yesterday on, um, on disclosure. So it's Senate Bill 107. Um, for those of you who write, like writing letters um, or perhaps writing a note to the Akron Beacon Journal. Um, uh, I'm the former editor, by the way. I bet he has friends. Um, uh, so, uh, so Senate Bill 107 um, requires uh, nothing really, but it permits, I know this is, you know, I'm like so I'm irritated by this bill. Um, it permits local candidates to file electronically with the boards of elections. The board of elections will then share it with the Secretary of State. Okay. They permit candidates to share what they raised and spent through a spreadsheet, which is good, right? Um, but, but they don't require it. And, and, and so the way that it works right now is if you're running for like the state house, um, if you raise $10,000, you're required to file electronically. And the benefit of filing electronically is it very quickly can be put online so that you can see it and search it and see it before the election. Mm -hmm. So here we have a disclosure bill, which I'm super excited about because there's a disclosure bill. And it's lame. It's incredibly, incredibly lame. So we all should work together to pressure them to fix it. But it's such a small piece of the puzzle. We need to push for really robust disclosure. Um, it's clearly constitutional. It's clearly needed. 
And it's incredibly sad to keep having these conversations about how money in politics is incredibly bad without us doing the one thing that we absolutely know we can do and both political parties agree on. Uh, someone else from the audience wants to know if, if, it is, if it is possible that foreign actors can hide behind non-disclosures and, um, and spend money to influence elections. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't know who you are, <laughs> how do we know that you're foreign? <laughs> uh, I, I would also add that, uh, that uh, it, uh, the Citizens United, the opinion of the Supreme Court in Citizens United uh, was not addressing an issue of, uh, uh, of uh, foreign money coming into uh, our elections. Um, reason in a way that really would imply that maybe it's constitutionally protected for foreign money to come in. I don't think they're gonna go there, but they've kind of opened the door to that <laughs> argument because, because their rationale essentially was uh, that they focused on the right of the listener to receive the information, the voters in this case, to receive the information. And it takes money to, to communicate information to voters. More money is great. Well, you get even more money if, if uh, foreigners can contribute. Now, I don't think they're gonna go there, but I think they're gonna have to reverse their reverse course on their reasoning in order to not go there. And it will be entertaining at least to see how they do that. Um, someone else from the audience wants to know if there are public funding models that are being tested in the United States and how they're doing. And then piggybacking on that, uh, someone wrote that Seattle was the first city to create a democracy voucher program which allowed uh, folks to uh, receive $25 vouchers to contribute to the candidate of his or her choice. Uh, so can you all talk about those two things? So public funding, the, you know, the Really, the, the, the first experiment with that was at the federal level, at the presidential level. And, um, it, you know, it, I think it had some success for a while and it has now failed because the money isn't enough. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense uh, for a candidate to uh, take the public money. It's, it's too limiting. They're running against somebody who's not taking the public money. They're going to be outgunned pretty, uh, pretty seriously. And so they're not any longer taking the money. And you know the moral of that story is if you provide public funding as an as an option, and it can only be an option. They have to be. It's tied to accepting an expenditure limit, right? If you take the public money, then you have to agree to a spending limit. That's okay as long as you have a choice. The Supreme Court held in Buckley versus Vallejo. Uh, uh, but if the if the money's too little, you're not going to you're not going to take it, and and that's what happening. Um, there have been uh, other attempts at public funding, you know, at the state level, but not a lot of them, and um, I'm hoping my co-panelists will know more about what the experience has been there. Oh, so, um, one, I wanted to say, so we, uh, we need to talk about public financing. There's, there's some really modest ways that you can do public financing. And so a close, you know, in Columbus, Ohio, for example, um, it's $50 um, that, that you can give and you get a tax credit. Um, now, obviously you have to owe taxes to, to have this model exactly work, but it's a way that's basically understandable. It's a way that encourages small donors. Um, so, you know, a, a couple could give $100, um, and, and that's a, a public financing mechanism that does engage smaller donors. Um, now, Seattle, um, which was mentioned, has this thing they call democracy vouchers, um, which is interesting. Um, what happened in Seattle um, was interesting. They really wanted to do public financing. It's kind of the, the traditional way where people would um, collect signatures, get small contributions, and then be given block grants when they qualified. Um, and the people there said, well, wait a second, I, I don't make campaign contributions. I, I don't see myself in the system at all. I don't quite understand how this will work. 
And they came up with something that was really experimental, which was the idea that the voters in Seattle would be given democracy dollars. And so let's say you get your 25, you get your 25 and 25, and you could choose who you were going to give that $25 voucher to. And then, you know, let's say Cinder's running and I gave her $25 and my partner decides, hey, here you go, there's your $25. It, slowly you would accrue some money and it would give you the advantage of doing a bunch of house parties and that idea that every little bit adds up. Um, and, and to make people a little bit closer to their, the goal was, of course, to make people feel closer to their community, to hear the people, and to understand what was going on in Seattle. And as you know, they have a housing crisis, and, and it was just, they were trying to think about how can we get our electives to connect to them. Now, I don't know how successful it is, because it's an experiment. One of the cool things is there, you know, there are opportunities for experimentation when it comes to public financing. And I think different communities should consider doing them to see what works. Or you could wait a few years and find out what happened in Seattle. I know that New York is considering a public financing measure. New York City has for many years had a partial public financing program that's worked fairly well. Um, and, and the goal always is about you know, addressing corruption and also about encouraging people to really get to know voters. So in my campaign finance class, we talk about three separate reforms, and one of them would be the public financing. So we always talk through what it is, what are some of the advantages, some of the disadvantages. And one thing that I want to point out, um, I, I mean, I feel like we need to talk about, is the fact that under all of the current proposals, well, I shouldn't say all, under most of the current proposals, the public funding is still voluntary. So that, that really limits the amount of money that will go into the system. So we really have to look at how, how then you know, can we help when it comes to campaign expenses. So, you know, there are thoughts of taking away paying for media, like radio and television time would have to be free for public funding to work. Well, what does that mean for the television stations and the radio stations who rely a lot on their campaign, you know, on the, on the campaign cycle to, to make their money? Um, so I think there's a lot of things like that that would need to be taken into consideration for any of these plans to be successful. Another thing is, I mean, it's easy to sit up here and talk about dark money being bad and special interests being bad, but there are actually some public service <coughs> special interest groups that are good, and taking away their influence could also could also harm the system, I think, as well. So playing devil's advocate a little bit, I just wanted to share some of that. Um, what y'all didn't talk about, uh, do any of you support an amendment to the Constitution focused on campaign finance reform? And if such an amendment passes, um, would it effectively overrule the Supreme Court decisions? The last part, part, too long. The, the last part is easy to ask, depending on what it says. <laughs> uh, the first part, my answer would be uh, yes, depending on what it says. <laughs> I've, I've seen some. I've seen some that I thought. In, were, in your mind, Bill, what would it say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one drafted, but uh, the tricky part is uh, making it not so vague that anything would go, because there really are First Amendment interests and in the rights at stake here, and and you know this would in effect be a, an amendment to the First Amendment, at least as interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, I don't think that means we should be against it, but it does mean that we need to be pretty careful about, uh, you know, about what it says. On the other hand, the Constitution is not a place for detailed campaign finance regulation. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a pretty tricky proposition to you know, find that middle ground. Where it's, it's not too vague, but it's not overly specific either. Um, one approach to, to it could be, you know, trust that uh, Congress won't go too crazy and trample people's First Amendment rights. But uh, right. yeah, that's, uh, it's uneasy. I'm uneasy saying it. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's not a it's not a comfortable thing. It, it needs work. The, the the proposals that I've seen, not the ones technically been proposed, but the the, the, the informal proposals that I've Seen, uh, have, I haven't seen one that I, I thought was good enough yet. So we we've understood that um, when it comes to free speech, that 
I do have this free speech, you know, that I can go into the middle of the street, right? And I can, I don't know, read the Bill of Rights. But perhaps I can't do that at 3 a.m. So when we start to think about the freedom of speech, there are things that we've done. So for example, how many of you have gone to testify at the Ohio State House? How many of you have gone down to city council to, to do some testifying? Okay, so when you go there, you're permitted a certain amount of time. Sometimes it's three minutes, sometimes it's five minutes. That's because in real life, when it comes to our First Amendment rights, our freedom of speech, we figured out, hey, we need to figure out a way so that a bunch of people have an opportunity to speak. Even informally, you know, it's one, two, three, we go back and forth, sometimes I talk too much. Um, but, but we've tried to figure it out, you know, we've tried to navigate our free speech. Now, once the court decided that artificial entities have First Amendment rights, I was ready to change the Constitution. I mean, right? I'm like, this is ridiculous. I mean, okay, if, if corporations have First Amendment rights, do they have rights to religion? Yes. Do they have, like, when you start to think about, like, the whole, I mean, it just seems like you're falling into, like, madness. And are we going to be an oligarchy? I'm like, it, it just seems incredibly crazy. Um, I do think when we think about something that is as simple as saying that money does not equal speech, you may need that money, and we know you do need that money, to get your message out. So I'm not naive about that. But they are, it's a vehicle, it's not the same thing. And so, do I think amending the Constitution would make a difference? Yes. Do I think it's possibly and likely necessary? Yes. And the reason I think that is because of the court that we have, and it could be a very, very long time before we, have, we address this problem in a significant way. And who here worked on ERA? Anybody in the room worked on ERA? Okay, it was a great loss in my mother's life. Like, I can, you know, I was very young, but like, I, you know, um, equal rights amendment girls. Um, so, <laughs> I know, sorry young people. All right, um, so, I bet you didn't know that um, when I was a girl, they decided that we girls didn't belong, anyway. <coughs> so, what I will say to you, about amending the U.S. Constitution. It's a tremendous amount of work. And so, we have to make some serious decisions. There are not enough people in this room right now to really talk about amending the Constitution. So, one of the things we could do is start to have conversations about, is it really necessary? Are we in a place in our um, representative democracy, republic, whatever you want to call it, are we at a place where we really need to actually amend the Constitution? Or are there other changes we can make? Or do we need to do both? And I would say, at this point, I'm ready to change the Constitution. This I'm over it. So I, I think that if we're ready to change the Constitution, and that's where people think that we need to go in order to change campaign finance, then why isn't direct democracy something that we're partaking in more regularly anyways? Why are ballot initiatives what, you know, look down upon like they are? Why isn't that more of a way that we're making policy decisions? I think if we, I think if we're going to, to change the Constitution, we might want to take a few practice runs in other ways to do direct democracy before really affecting major policy change like that in the federal constitution. Cinder, are you suggesting that we do some direct democracy to put disclosure <laughs> on dark money? Let's do it. I say we start a ballot committee tonight. <laughs> There is no such thing as direct democracy at the federal level <laughs> by, the, by, the, by design. Um, and, uh, and of course, the Constitution um, could be a, amended in that regard, but I don't think that's politically realistic. Um, and I, I did want to add that, you know, here's, here's an example of something that it would not be difficult to draft a constitutional amendment that would be sufficiently uh, precise and uh, not too vague and would, would work if it could be passed. I think politically it's not likely to pass. But on the question of, of whether corporations have First Amendment rights, that, that it wouldn't be hard to change the Constitution to clarify. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether you can get three quarters of the states to ratify such an amendment, which is what would be necessary, is, I think, uh, 
questionable at best. Uh, I was thinking more in terms of uh, you know, a larger, and, and, that, and that would solve a piece of the problem. I was thinking in terms of something that would really address some of the problems that were created even by the Supreme Court, even as far back as Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976. And I think those are the ones that are much harder, it's just much harder to draft in a, a constitutional amendment uh, that wouldn't go too far in either the direction of vagueness or in the direction of you know detailed regulations that would then be so difficult to change and would tend to need change because they're so specific and circumstances have changed. And I'm just curious, when was the last time this country passed a constitutional amendment? <laughs> uh, so the most the most recent amendment which passed, I don't remember the exact year, it was around 1992, I think it was, uh, was the, the, the one that uh, prohibited Congress from enacting the pay raises that took effect during the current session, but it was proposed in 1790. <laughs> <laughs> it has been forgotten about. It's been forgotten about. And some, <laughs> and, and some students, I can't remember this, political science or history, some graduate student actually, you know, sort of rediscovered this amendment. That was back in the days when, when the Congress didn't put deadlines on ratification the way they did the DRA and the way they've been doing throughout the 20th, or did do throughout the 20th century. Um, and so, uh, and then and then this person sort of got a movement started. It was in Michigan to it was one state short of uh, ratification. Got Michigan to ratify, and it became part of the Constitution. So, if the question is, when was the Constitution? When did the last constitutional amendment? Uh, when was it adopted? It was the, it, it, it was the twenty seventh amendment, and it was I think in nineteen ninety two. But the proposal what came from the. Late <laughs> uh, here's, here's, a, here's another good question from the audience. Uh, what is more important, uh, spending limits or transparency? Transparency. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> also, transparency is, is constitutionally possible. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're looking for transparency, can each of you tell me your best source of information to find? where the money is coming from and how it's being spent? I, I mean, I think with the internet, but yeah, with the internet today, it's a whole lot easier than what it was even when I first started teaching the class. I, for Ohio, I still like Ohio Secretary of State for the statewide stuff. I mean, it's, the website continues to improve. Um, for national stuff, I mean, I, I happen to go back to Open Secrets just because that's what I've always used and I'm most comfortable with it. I don't know if... Uh, I, I, I agree about Open Secrets and about the Ohio Secretary of State uh, office. You know, if you want to think at the local level, your only real option is the Board of Elections. And because the filings are on paper, <laughs> not electronic, uh, you know, what we do is we scan the campaign finance reports. Uh, we make them into uh, PDFs and put those online. Um, and so you have to figure out what which you, you, you get a list of committees, right? And you figure out which committee uh, you want to campaign finance report you want to look at, and, and you can look at them, but you can't search. It's not it, it's not searchable, and so it's it's a tedious. Process. Senate Bill One O Seven. Yeah. It just needs to be beefed up so it's required. So I do also like followthemoney.org. Um, that's state level money. It's like the National Institute on State Politics. Um, the other thing to know, like if you're doing research and you get stuck, they are actually very good about helping. So um, there's, you know, you can go through it and, and something. It's like any software. You can get like hung up on something and not know what the next step is. Um, but they do have people to provide like a mini tutorial or to walk you through. And I've literally been um, in situations where I was like, I need this information in 24 hours. And they've been like, sure, this is how you get it. Um, so they're, they're very good. So it's followthemoney.org. Um, just a quick clarification for someone who the audience wants to know you've been referring to this Buckley decision. Can you tell us in two sentences what that decision was? I don't know about two sentences. I'll try to keep it short, though. Uh, the Supreme Court struck down parts of the Federal Election Campaign Act 
it was enacted in the wake of Watergate. Uh, it, uh, it struck down the, expenditure, the, the spending limits that the Federal Election Campaign Act imposed. Uh, and it struck down uh, the prohibition or limitation on uh, self-funding of campaigns. And on the other hand, it upheld contribution limits. I can't tell you the reasoning in in another sentence that would take long. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a different way, here's a different approach here. Um, if enough states decide to give all of their electoral college votes to the winner of the presidential election's popular vote, <coughs> uh, what impact would that have on campaign finance? I think I asked that question in a clear way. There's still be a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> so there likely would be a lot of money. It would maybe change how the money was spent and where it was spent. Certainly where. Where, but like, um, so so one of the things that we all know is, oh, I'm sorry. One of the things that we that we know is money in politics is one part of the problem. And so, so as we think about, like, you know, we, we need to think about voting rights, and we need to think about, as we move into the new map making, um, we need to think about making sure that that's as transparent as possible, and we have citizen map makers, and that we push to have these good maps. But um, whatever reform we're focusing on, um, whether it's campaign finance reform, or thinking about changing the electoral college, it's one piece of the puzzle, and they don't always impact one another. I, I just had to add a comment that's not directly related to the money issue, which is the thing that, that does worry about the, me about the national popular vote is we will have election contests all over the country instead of just in a state or two or three. Mm -hmm. We need to consider that. Something that doesn't relate to this question, but I feel the need to address. Um, if you are interested in Supreme Court law as it relates to um, campaign finance reform, I have four court cases that I recommend. Buckley is one, Citizens United is one, but then also um, McConnell versus the FEC and McCutcheon versus the FEC. Those are two other ones that really um, kind of shifted the dynamic of, of campaign finance and how it's applied, so I recommend. Is that uh, yeah. Yeah, the question was, was that uh, McConnell was mentioned on uh, the <coughs> from Kentucky, and the answer is yes, he was the plan. So the other thing that occurred to me is if you're interested in not just the, you know, the, like, hey, I want to know where the, the money comes from, and I want to kind of look at databases, the Brennan's Fritz Center for Justice has done a number of studies that look at the role of money in politics. So the role of money in judicial elections, for example, the role of dark money in judicial elections. So it's worth, it's you know, so, sometimes you want, you, you don't want the number, and sometimes you want the story. So it's the Brennan Center for Justice at, at New York University. Okay. Um, in May, Ohio passed a um, redistricting initiative. Do you think that will have any effect on money in politics? Yes. If you have competitive elections, people spend more money. Is that a good thing? Or bad? It's good to have competitive elections, and <coughs> so, so sometimes when we think about money, we think you know money is not so we say the root of all evil, but it's not actually evil. Um, so which is why when we're, we're talking about small donor races, I just think that we will have much more interesting elections. And that does actually mean more money, um, and that can be good or it can ba be bad. Um, but we should be thinking about, you know, making those elections more interesting by making sure that we get to know the candidates and get as much information as we can. And before we get to that point, making sure that we have good disclosure so that we can consider the source of these political advertisements. <coughs> uh, well, I guess I would just say, you know, it remains to be seen how much more competitive the races will be, as opposed to perhaps uh, how, how much more reflective of the uh, partisan makeup of the population uh, our representatives will be. You could, those, those are not totally related to each other. Uh, so <coughs> you actually have uh, you know, not a whole lot more competitive races, but still some beneficial effect, from my point of view at least, uh, you know, from, from this uh, from these uh, 
uh, changes. Uh, but I, but I think that you know there's there's not uh, other than if to the extent that we have more competitive races, yes, there probably be some more money spent, which is uh, as you say not an American <coughs> thing. Um, it depends a little on where it comes from and so forth. Um, it, uh, uh, apart from that, I don't think it's going to have much of an effect on campaign finance. So if it does make the races more competitive and more money is needed at those levels, at the you know the federal level to wage campaigns, then we do need to think about the cost that it's going to be to local candidates to get their message out as well. I think you know if more money is being spent at the higher level, that's you know drowning out the voices down at the bottom even more. So I think you know we need to be really strategic about how we handle races at the local level um, to to get above all of that money that's being spent because. It doesn't matter how much money you can raise at the local level if you're not on par with what they're doing and their messages on TV and radio and in print, it, it, it just becomes even more difficult to do. I, that's not to say that the redistricting reform is a bad thing. I think, I think to the extent that we can encourage competitive races, we need to at every level. It's just something that you know we need to think through at the local level. We've been talking about money in politics in a negative way. Um, can you think of any positive to go with how money is being spent in politics? Is there any good that comes of the money that's being spent in politics? So how about instead of spent and raised, um, uh, you know, there have been some positive developments in in that area, and that's the you know, small donor uh, contributions, uh, mostly through the internet. I mean, the internet has, I think, if it's had some bad effects in politics, especially recently, but also some good effects. It's made it possible for uh, candidates, particularly you know, at the higher levels, uh, to uh, to raise money in small amounts and in ways that don't threaten democratic values at all. In fact, they're quite consistent with again small D democratic values. Um, so there's that. Is much money being raised? Do you all know through these, through small donations? <laughs> yeah, the Obama campaign in 08, uh, uh, Bernie, and Kamala Harris just recently. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, can, it can add. I mean, to an extent, the president did a very good job with small dollar increments as well. Um, when I ever I spoke about this to the newsroom, they were reminding me that my perfect world only exists in my mind. It doesn't exist anyplace else. So in your perfect world, in each of your minds, what is the solution here? What should we do here? What is the perfect solution for us to move forward in our democracy? Is it really a perfect world in your mind? Questions, please stay. I mean, I think <laughs> I'll take it, which is, you know, it, it's funny because my, my first class every semester, instead of really launching into teaching about campaign finance, we have a discussion. and. You know, it's a room like this full of people with very strong opinions about what campaign finance reform should look like, and they write it down and make them write it down and say, what, you know, what would your perfect world be? And then by the end, we bring those papers back, I collect them, and then I pass them back out, and I say, okay, now that you've taken a class and you understand the law and the practicality and the Supreme Court decisions, what do you think? And the smartest student that I've ever had took it and ripped it up and threw it up in the air. And said, I just don't know. And of course, I mean, I didn't mean to make him cynical. I didn't mean to, you know, give him no faith in the ability to move forward. But um, one thing that he just, I mean, he ultimately decided, um, and he was a Democrat. He would, he would not be somebody that, you know, I would ever think would say this, but he was like, I think we just need to lift every restriction, but make absolutely everything reportable take away any limits on contributions, take away, because then if you have the ability to give the candidate as much money as you want to and they can spend it however they want to, why do you have, now this again was kind of right as Citizens United happened and you know we weren't really seeing the effects of what dark money was, but I don't think that that's the answer. Um, but I do think that the, the reporting piece is absolutely critical to anybody's perfect world of campaign finance reform. So how, how many of you in this room, when the internet gained popularity, okay, it was top, late 90s, had this idea that um, the role of television in political and political advertisement 
and the money related to that would shift and be completely different. And we would have ways <laughs> to like educate people. That in fact, you know, part of part of what um, I struggle with is it is that um, we have all of this political messaging and so little actual information, right? Yeah. We just have so little actual information. And so uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm so about disclosure. I want us to have the information so we can make good choices. But what would be a, a perfect world <coughs> for me would involve um, free television uh, for candidates. It would involve um, making sure that we got li really robust voter guides. Uh, I, um, and the League of Women Voters does a lovely job, but I want every single household to receive voter guides that get us you know, down to the judges where so many of us forget about them. I, I would like to see us have a lot of information. I would like a shift where we have all sorts of conversation and at the end of the day, I am still very peeved that corporations have First Amendment rights. I'm <laughs> So, you know, in my perfect world, we the voters would have the information we needed to cast an educated ballot. She's teasing me. I think she's mean. <laughs> costless communication, right? I mean, what we're talking about is how do you pay for communication, political communication? Uh, if it didn't cost anything, we wouldn't really have the money problem. We, we still have the potential for corruption, right? We'd have to release that, but, but we wouldn't have the, the, the campaign finance problem. Um, I don't think we can, you know, this is why I don't think much about perfect worlds. You know, I don't think we can, uh, you know, set things up so that there is costless political communication. And it would have a large drawback, which is, of course, you'd get way too much of it. Um, because it doesn't cost anything. Yeah. Um, and you'd hear maybe nothing else. Um, but, you know, rather than talk about a perfect world, I'd rather talk about things, you know, we could do uh, that, that wouldn't be all that difficult to do, at least if we could somehow muster the political will and you know that would those would include imposing you know reporting requirements on entities that don't currently have them or that have them for expenditures but not for <coughs> um, uh, IRS enforcement of the uh, of the of the primary purpose requirement for uh, 501c4 is they, they you know they, they you, know, you don't qualify to be a 501c4 if your primary purpose is to engage in political activity, well, clearly <coughs> these 501 C4s do little else, uh, and and the IRS has done nothing about it really. Um, and so th there are a number of things that could be done to uh, not perfectly, but address pretty well the problem of dark money, which is only a, only one aspect of the problems we're talking about. But I, I think that would be worth focusing on because that's something that is, I think, achievable, if not in the current political environment, because it would have to be done on a bipartisan basis, and pretty much nothing is being done on a bipartisan basis. Right now. I mean, additionally, and I think it probably goes without saying, but in a perfect world, or even in the world that we live in now, trying to enact change, we just need a more engaged electorate. Uh, I mean, I think. You, you're right, yeah. <laughs> no, that's one thing I can't do. Would you all support uh, mandatory voting? I'm just curious. I think Australia does it. Have I got that right? Yeah. yeah. Australia has mandatory voting, and you get slapped with a minimum fat if you don't if you don't vote. Choosing not to participate is a choice. Well, the question is, should that choice? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's not a good choice, but it's still a choice. <laughs> Well, we do mandate things. I wouldn't mandate this one uh, because basically you're forcing people who don't vote because they feel they don't know enough to vote. And, and I guess you're hoping that if they, uh, you know, that if they know they have to vote, they will 
acquire the necessary information. I just don't have a lot of confidence in what's happening. So they're essentially delegating to the rest of us uh, the decision. And uh, you know, while we certainly should encourage people to inform themselves and to vote, uh, I, I think it would be counterproductive in some ways to actually require them to vote. What about a mandated holiday so that people will want to vote in? The question was, what about a mandated holiday? Well, I mean, the, so the larger question is, you know, how can we make it easier? Should we make it easier for people to vote? And, and how can we do that? And, and you know, making the general election day, I think you're talking about the primary election day, uh, the general election day uh, a holiday, you know, would certainly make it easier for quite a few people uh, to vote. And uh, personally, I would, I would support that. But there are other ways that we can, and to some extent we have, made it easier for people to vote. We have early voting, now the hours aren't so great, but most of the time you can only vote during the time when you would be working. But, <laughs> but no fault absentee. Right, no fault absentee, uh, uh, you know, is is helpful in some ways. It, it's a little problematic in that, you know, much, much too much has been made of uh, so, so-called uh, voter fraud. What opportunity, there's very little of it, but what there is of it that occurs is with mail-in voting. Um, and, and you know, anybody can be filling out that ballot with no, no way of knowing uh, you know, okay. who, who filled out the ballot, right? Um, uh, and, and, and the other thing is, of course, that sometimes things do go wrong in the mail, and, and not every ballot gets counted. So, so would you support like longer hours, let's say the three days before the election? <coughs> you know, something where where you're, you're starting, you know, eight a.m. to eight p.m. for example, or even nine p.m. Would that be something that you would support? Sure. I would say for for a very short period of time, I think that would be wonderful. Uh, I I, I, don't, I I wouldn't make it only a few days. Would you I'd make it for four weeks? I, I, there are some people at the board of elections. Staff, it probably wouldn't be so <laughs> so <laughs> That's okay. So it, 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 is, it, it is interesting because we did have a period of time where the hours were, were longer. They went well into the evening. And so you know, that's the kind of thing where I think, you know, I feel for the Board of Election. I, you know, not, every, not every board is Summit County or Franklin County where I live. Um, but certainly those longer hours would address what you're getting at with a holiday, which is making it convenient, uh, making it accessible and convenient. And you know, it, it comes down to money and the question <laughs> is, you know, are, are we as a society, are we as a county, uh, you know, do we think it's valuable enough to spend the money on, you know, the additional part-time employees to be able to allow people to, to vote in the evenings in the week or in the two before the election? And my answer would be, it's, it's well worth it. It doesn't cost a lot. Um, looking out here at the audience, what can members of our audience do to, if they feel if they have a strong feeling about this, what can they do? What's their next step? What you you want to mention it? <coughs> we'll set it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I mentioned Senate Bill 107. Um, so, so the League of Women Voters does some really wonderful programming like this. And often the next thing is, well, what are the what are the kinds of things that you that you can actually do? Um, so there, you know, there are study groups that focus on how we can actually move disclosure at the state house. Um, there are folks like me that organize people to come and testify. So if you're somebody who says, you know what, I really want to see good disclosure, I would be willing to take, you know, do some written testimony, or I'd be willing to go down to the state house and testify to let them know that, you know, this type of disclosure is really important. Um, so Move to Amend is very active in this region, so you should consider getting involved with them if you're interested in changing the Constitution. There are lots of different ways to get engaged, um, and fortunately, um, the League of Women Voters are here. Jackie, where are you? Okay, so Jackie's over there, so she's League of Women Voters of Akron, um, and, um, and you can always touch base with me as well. You can take my class. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I would add that you know, in, in addition to um, uh, the, the sort of 
lobbying approach, the people who make these decisions are our elected representatives. Um, you can talk to them. <coughs> That's <And> lobbying. <laughs> right, but, but you know, as opposed to testimony for the legislature, um, and beyond that, engagement in politics, support the candidates that you think are going to help take us in the right direction on these issues. Obviously, you got to consider their positions on other issues as well. But make it make it make this important enough that number one, you communicate to them so they know, uh, you know where at least some of their electorate stands on it, their constituents stand on it. But um, you know, su support candidates who. Uh, who will uh, do the things that you want done and oppose the candidates who you think will oppose it. Uh, this is a question that's just been staring at me in the face here from the audience, and i got to ask it because it does intersect somewhat with money and politics. How do we make the 1% pay their fair share of taxes? <laughs> Change campaign finance. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, it, so one of the things um, that's really clear to me is we live with the consequences of the system that we have right now every single day. When we drive down a road and there are huge potholes in it, when we look at the funding system for our kids, when we start to think about the problems um, that have happened um, with taxation. So um, let, let's just talk about the estate tax. You know, local communities are really hurting because that we don't have the estate tax anymore. Um, so yes, there are things that we can do, but clearly um, everything is connected. And so as we think about money and politics, we need to be thinking about well, what are the decisions that are made at the state house. And and there was this really <coughs> interesting taxation policy that was passed by Congress that really benefited the wealthy, benefited the people that were political players. And so as we think about cha making changes um, related to changes in taxation, and um, you know, we have lots of regressive taxes, and for example, the gasoline tax. So if we're thinking about changing the taxation system, we also need to think about addressing the money politics situation. And this gets back to an engaged electorate and really pushing on these folks. And it's an uphill battle. This is a little depressing, isn't it? I mean, it, and so also taking good care of ourselves. You know, because we're in for the long haul. We are in the Gilded Age. We are in the Gilded Age. It's time to be muckrakers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's someone who wants to know, uh, would, it, would a lot of the issues be resolved if honesty was somehow a requirement? <laughs> <laughs> but people have First Amendment rights. <laughs> the right to lie. <laughs> so your answer is no. Oh, no. Are we talking perfect world? Uh, I think we're back in person. Yeah. <laughs> so, so one of the things that happened um, in the past couple of years is we had this thing called the Election Commission, and at the Ohio Election Commission, you, uh, you could go as a candidate and say that the other candidate said something that was untrue in their advertisement, <laughs> or, you know, something, their mailing or whatever. And it provided a useful service in that you had Democrats, Republicans, Independents looking at something and saying, okay, this is unfair or there's enough information, we'll, we'll, you know, we will actually have a hearing. It was useful, and yet there's something that makes me really squeamish about the government deciding what's true. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and, and so, so, so one of the challenges when it comes to honesty is everything would function better. Boy, our marriages would be great if we were all honest, right? Um, you know, our relationships, our relationships with our kids, like our relationships with one another, as much as, much as possible to be above board. Um, but it's very hard to imagine regulating that. Um, this will be the final question. We're running out of time here, I think. Um, 
the writer says the first thing for change has to be the will to change, which we've talked about. But uh, the question here, I think, is that uh, should everyone work with the same amount of money that he or she is allowed to spend on the campaign? You know, to put a cap on spending. So, Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976 that he's made allusions to um, decided that it's, there's, a, there's a public benefit to addressing quid pro quo. Um, but when it comes to telling people how much they can spend, that becomes a little complicated because you're getting in the way of their ability to buy yard signs, their ability to um, you know, uh, pay for uh, TV ads, etc. And so um, money isn't speech, but it's the gas that makes the car go. So you couldn't put a limitation on it. And I'm going to hand it over to the group. Yeah, I mean, it's unconstitutional, so I don't think. I, I, I don't know whether the question was really about whether it's permissible no, or sure. it's constitutional. Well, that's perfect rule space. Oh, no. <laughs> perfect rule space. I was thinking that might have been what was, uh, what was intended. Um, I, I, I think. Um, it would be it would be problematic, um, and this takes me back to the question of the, you know the tension between our democratic uh, political system and our uh, capitalist economic system. Um, you know, if we all had the same amount of money to start with, we kind of wouldn't really have this problem. When you have a very uh, unequal distribution of wealth in, in the society, uh, the question is, you know, how would you ever get to the place where you know, basically everybody would have the same resources to bring to bear in political communication in, 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 for campaign? So you all don't need to raise your hand, um, but how? Uh, let's let's do this one first. You can raise your hand. Um, how many of you have made a campaign contribution? All right, we are an unusual audience. Okay, so let's start with that. Now, this one I'm not asking you to raise your hand. How many of you have given to the maximum at either the federal or state level? And I won't out the rich people in the room, but just. So there is. I don't want to know about this. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> I'll confess to doing it at the federal level, but. <laughs> so I guess the reason the reason that I'm the reason that I'm mentioning this is because it it was even hard for me to conceive the perfect world where, of course, you know, when um, after Watergate, when they were trying to create a system, having campaign contribution limits and spending limits, that seemed an obvious thing to do to address mm -hmm. corruption. So in their perfect world, that would have addressed corruption. Um, but the Supreme Court made a decision. It's hard to argue a lot about the idea that, I'm going to do this, the idea that, in fact, money is used for these things. So limiting spending is somewhat problematic constitutionally, at least at the moment. Um, and so it's hard for me sometimes to imagine the perfect world where you could do what is truly obvious. And I think it's the challenge of money in politics. The, the really obvious things to do are not constitutional. One, what is the, the rationale that uh, putting the bit of spending limit is the same for everyone? That's equality. What, what's the rationale that says that's not constitutional? The, they want to know the constitutional rationale. I actually have the line from the ruling. It just says it's clear that a primary effect of these expenditure limitations is to restrict the quality of campaign speech by individuals, groups, and candidates, the court said. So long as persons or groups askew expenditures that oh never mind, that's a different part of the law. So that I mean that was their that was their reasoning. <laughs> well I mean embedded in it is right. really the idea that uh, if you've got if, you, if you've got more money than everybody else, you have a constitutional right to communicate more, to use it to communicate more than everyone else does. And it raises, you know, I think the question about the core meaning of the guarantee of freedom of speech uh, and 
the, I would say that the primary purpose of guaranteeing freedom of speech, not the only one, but the primary purpose uh, for guaranteeing freedom of speech was to make it possible to have democratic self-rule. I mean, you can't have democratic self-rule in a society where people aren't free to communicate with, uh, with each other, particularly on, on matters of politics and <coughs> um, uh, If the primary purpose uh, is to uh, make democratic self-rule possible, then we have to ask you know, what we mean by democratic self-rule. And if it is rooted in the principle of equality, uh, as, as I think it is, uh, then, then an interpretation of the guarantee of freedom of speech that essentially says those who have the most are entitled to speak the most if they choose to use their money that way, um, it, it actually disserves uh, the, the purpose of the First Amendment insofar as it is making democratic self-rule possible. That is, it essentially says that our First Amendment is rooted more in, uh, more, more in a no notion of plutocracy than democracy. And that's where I think the fundamental flaw of the court's reasoning all the way back to Buckley versus Vallejo is. Uh, but it is a tough problem, right? I mean, it, it, so you start thinking about right, how would we do it, there, there would be some serious challenges if we were free to do it, right? Uh, which, they, for the, you know, since 1976, we have, we have not. I would like to thank the panel for your answers.